Hello, eighth grade students. We have learned that Ms. Valand is a spy. And fortunately, she's a spy really for France. And it's uh, really filled with intrigue that for five years, she worked um, kind of at the pleasure, if you will, of the Nazis. And they did not know that she could speak German, that she understood German. And then she really became a, a spy and gathered information and documents and photos. And then she hid it away until the point where the Nazis were being pushed back out of France, out of Italy, into Germany, and it appeared they were going to be defeated. Uh, it's amazing, literally, that she wasn't killed. I think the part where they told us, or she felt that, that they probably were going to put her on the train, and when they crossed from France into Germany, they were going to um, kill her, was, it's a miracle that did not happen. So here we are. She was really the person with the quote, treasure map. We're at the bottom of page 166. On July 23rd, 1944, a German military truck delivered to the interior garden of the Jaw de Pont Museum five to 600 paintings by Picasso, Dali, Legere, Miro, Klee, and others that the Nazis considered degenerate and unsuitable even for sale or trade. German soldiers then tossed them one by one onto a flaming bonfire. With a mixed look of anger and sorrow, she added, nothing could be saved. The lightness of being that Rormer had experienced riding his bicycle to Valan's apartment had changed in a matter of hours. His ride home felt completely different. Valan, no doubt, with Shazar's encouragement, hadn't just entrusted her information to Rormer, she handed it over to him. He now had the weight of the world on his shoulders. The Nazi hiding place on Valan's list were all located in what would become 7th Army territory, his army, his territory, and now his responsibility. Fighting a war against an enemy was one thing. Fighting a war against a madman was something entirely different. Would Hitler, a man who had professed his love of art and desired to be recognized as an artist, really order the destruction of the very thing he so revered? Balan had no doubt that he would. Romer agreed, and that added even more urgency to the mission of the Monuments Men. Now, it was a race against time. So if you remember back to the beginning of the book, Adolf Hitler considered himself a great artist, and he applied to an art school and to attend and become an artist. And he was denied entry into that art school. He was not accepted. That denial to Adolf Hitler, he used that to change, if you will, his life course in a direction that was horrific. In, in so many ways, on so many levels. And as Romer called him, a madman. So what would prevent him from destroying all the art that he had collected? He was, he was killing hundreds of thousands of people. So in his anger, the thought um, by Romer and others 
would be that Hitler would order that all of this art be destroyed, burned, as, he, as they had with the other paintings. Cleve, Germany, March 10th, 1945. After two months in a hospital, British Monuments man Ronald Balfour felt as though he could survive anything. At any other time in his life, he would have praised the heavens to have so much uninterrupted, uninterrupted time for reading. Being stuck on the sidelines at a time when an epic fight to the death was taking place at the Battle of the Bulge pained him more than the truck accident that broke his ankle did. The Allied armies already had a shortage of monuments officers. His unavailability just made things worse. Balfour eagerly returned to action in February, making, in, making inquiries about the missing Bruges Madonna in the southwestern town of Lissingen, Netherlands. Rumors continued to circulate that the thieves had loaded the Madonna onto a Red Cross ship that passed through the historic port before sailing the North Sea to Germany. But Balfour concluded that they were just rumors. Five months had passed since the theft with no sightings or substantial leads. In all likelihood, Michelangelo's masterpiece had already been stashed somewhere in Germany. That suited Balfour because first Canadian army was now in Germany, which put him one step closer to finding it. By early March, many German towns along the lower Rhine River were in allied hands, the result of operations veritable and blockbuster. But the immensity of destruction from allied bombing was astonishing. Estimates of damage to the town of Cleve, birthplace of Henry VIII's fourth wife, Anne, approached 90%. A dozen monuments men would have a difficult time keeping up with all the work. First Canadian Army had just won. Less than one mile from the front, under constant shelling, Balfour spent his days inspecting historic buildings, city archives and churches, salving documents and objects, even fragments of value. On March 3rd, during a lull in the fighting, he found time to write his friend, Lieutenant Colonel Jeffrey Webb, the senior ranking monuments officer. Webb looked forward to Balfour's field reports more than those of any other monuments officer. Balfour's sense of humor and keen insights made them a good read. It was a splendid week for my job, certainly the best since I came over, Balfour wrote. On the one hand, there is the tragedy of real destruction, much of it completely unnecessary. On the other, the comforting feeling of having done something solid myself. Looting by allied troops was an unending problem. When off limit signs proved ineffective, Balfour improvised and began confiscating objects himself as a measure of last resort. This created a new problem, where to put them. Always up for a challenge, Balfour created a makeshift repository in the attic of a building in Cleve. Although occupied by troops and refugees with no proper protection, the building had what most other buildings in town did not, a roof, doors, and windows. Inside the attic's locked doors, Balfour stored medieval town records, statues, and church vestments salvaged from various ruins. He even befriended a local monk who watched over the place when he was away on inspections. We're gonna stop there, middle page 169, and that's where we pick up tomorrow. Thank you so much, eighth graders. Take care of yourselves now, bye.